I don't know about you guys, but around here during the quarantine, a lot of my closets got cleaned. And as I was cleaning closets, I was thinking about how cleaning closets is a lot, explains a lot about the way the human kidney works. So before we talk any more about the details of what's going on when the kidney is cleaning your blood, let's explore my analogy. So let's imagine that somewhere in your house, there is a closet that looks like this. It's probably not yours, might belong to your messy sister, right? Now, there are a couple of ways of cleaning that closet. One way to clean that closet is to just look at the stuff that's still hanging up, and if you don't like it, throw it out of the closet and pick up stuff from the ground and decide whether you wanted to keep it or not and hang it up or don't hang it up. That's one way to do it. That's not the way your kidney works, okay? The way your kidney works is to look at this mess and go, oh, hell no, and just take almost everything out of the closet, right? Now, some things would get left behind. <clears throat> you're gonna leave the hanging rods, you're gonna leave the hangers, you know, those things get left behind. But everything else comes out. Now, everything comes out. So that means these spiffy yellow, jogging pants, I'm guessing, that your mom just bought, those are, need to leave too. And your mom's gonna go, no, I love those yellow jogging pants, okay? Um, doesn't matter, mom, we'll put them back in when we're done, right? Now, either way, the goal is to get from this kind of a closet to gorgeous closet, but there's different ways to do it. When we are thinking about how the kidney is doing things, I find it useful to, to think of it in this context, that all kinds of things are going to be, oh, in this analogy, the closet is going to be your bloodstream, right? You want your bloodstream to be nice and orderly, no trash left behind. So when your blood leaves the kidney, it should look like that. It came into the kidney looking like that. And the way your kidney dealt with it was by basically taking almost everything out and then only putting back what it decided it wanted to keep, okay? So let's look at it uh, one more time. Uh, I want to emphasize that although this drawing seems to have some anatomical detail, this is not anatomical, okay? This is a schematic, right? So when it comes to cleaning your blood, it starts here at the glomerulus. And what's going to happen at the glomerulus is filtration. The fluid that gets filtered out of the glomerulus is going to be captured here by Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. And this fluid is almost exactly like plasma. It is like plasma, but without the large proteins. Now, that means that an amino acid you just absorbed from lunch, it's here. You're not planning to throw that away, right? Amino acids, sugars, those are things that are very, very valuable. But don't worry, because even though it starts out here, it's going to get put back into the closet at, at the next step, right? Now, uh, one of the things I like about this schematic is that it emphasizes that the diameter of the afferent arteriole is much greater than the diameter of the efferent arteriole. That's going to be important for creating enough blood pressure to get a really uh, serious amount of filtration pressure in here. The diameter of the paratubular capillaries is actually, is actually um, large in the way that will cause blood pressure to drop in the paratubular capillaries. Um, and that'll be an important part of this story as well. So step one, glomerular filtration. Step two, step two is called tubular reabsorption, right? And what's gonna happen is the simple cuboidal epithelial cells that make up this structure that at this moment is probably the proximal convoluted tubule, those cells are going to grab things from in here and put them back into the bloodstream, right? So. A moment ago, everything went out of the closet. Now there will be simple cuboidal epithelial cells going, oh, there are those terrific yellow jogging pants that she loves. There's her favorite pair of jeans. 
and is grabbing those things from the already formed filtrate and putting it back into the bloodstream. Now, why is it called tubular reabsorption and not tubular absorption? It's called tubular reabsorption because these things were absorbed the first time from your intestinal tract, right? Tubular reabsorption is removing useful solutes from the filtrate and returning them to the blood. So you just emptied out the closet. Now all the good stuff that you took out, you're putting back in the blood, right? Okay. Now, tubular secretion. The exact same cells, the exact same cells that are grabbing, ooh, those are my best genes, I'm putting those away. They're also going, really, how many black t-shirts does anyone need? I'm going to throw that one into this stuff that's going to become fluid. So when the simple cuboidal epithelial cells grab something from the filtrate and put it into the blood, tubular reabsorption. When they're looking at the blood and going, wait, way too many hydrogen ions, no one needs that many, puts it into the already formed filtrate, that is called tubular secretion. And tubular secretion is really important as well. So glomerular filtration happens at the renal corpuscle. Reabsorption and secretion, that happens at the proximal convoluted tubule, nephron loop, distal convoluted tubule, all three, right? This last step. This last step is termed water conservation. I wish it had a different name, frankly, because by the time the stuff that's soon going to be urine, by the time it gets to this step, almost all of the water has been reabsorbed you're going to reabsorb like 99% of the water that begins this journey. A lot of water comes out at the beginning of this step, this filtration, and 99% of it gets reabsorbed. Almost all of that 99% gets reabsorbed up in the tubules. But there's a very important step um, that happens at the collecting duct. So that's going to be step three. Step three, the, the water conservation happens at the collecting duct and the collecting duct is the only part of this story that can really change the tonicity of your blood. Remember, your blood needs to be isotonic, right? What if you just went nutto on salty junk food today? Salty popcorn, sushi with soy sauce, you just had a salty field day, right? Well, your blood would get hypertonic and that would cause your cells to shrivel up because the saltiness of your blood would draw the water into that compartment. Why don't you have to worry about that? Because of your collecting duct, right? So we've really got, from my mind, four steps. They divided it up into three, um, but make sure you know them because we're going to talk about them now in more like gory detail, right? Step one. Step one is filtration. And you did filtration in lab, probably, but filtration is really not any more complicated than um, straining the spaghetti after you cooked it, right? Uh, you are going to use the pressure, hydrostatic pressure, to force fluid through some kind of a membrane and that membrane was going to trap larger particles behind. Now, uh, this allows me to talk in some detail about the lovely nature of the glomerulus itself. Uh, the glomerulus was specifically designed to be a superior filtration membrane. It's superior for a number of reasons. One is it has got a high hydrostatic pressure inside of it. There is a lot of pressure pushing against the wall of the capillary there, forcing fluid out, right? So it's got high glomerular capillary blood pressure. The blood pressure inside of this, this capillary called the glomerulus, much higher than in any other capillary bed. And then the capillary bed, the structure of it, those simple squamous epithelial cells, it is more complicated and yet also leakier than a typical capillary bed. Also, there are really a lot of capillaries in your kidney. I know your kidneys don't look that big, but we've taken capillaries and wadded them all up into little balls. 
there are a lot of capillaries inside of there. So let's look at a little more detail at the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle kind of has two halves. It's got the glomerulus, that's the vascular portion, and it has got the Bowman's capsule, which is the collecting area. Now, Bowman's capsule has got this parietal layer. It's actually the parietal layer that's going to catch the fluid coming out. And then it's got the visceral layer. The visceral layer are the podocytes. The podocytes are an additional layer of the filtration membrane. So it's almost like, it's almost like you've got like a spaghetti strainer. And then on the outside of the spaghetti strainer, you've got a layer of filter paper, right? It's got two layers. Let's look at a little more detail about this orientation. We have got the afferent arteriole that is bringing fluid into the glomerulus and an efferent arteriole that's taking blood away. The diameter of the afferent arteriole is bigger. And that means that with the given blood pressure, a lot of blood is going in, but it's kind of getting backed up. That, that getting backed up because the exit tube from the glomerulus has got a smaller diameter than the entry tube. That is what causes there to be higher blood pressure in the glomerular capillary bed than any other capillary. That's definitely on your study guide. Why is there a higher blood pressure in the glomerulus than a typical capillary? Simply because the afferent arteriole has got a larger diameter than the efferent arteriole. Here's how I think about it. I think of the glomerulus kind of simplistically as being like some sort of a basketball and we punched holes in it, right? Now, if I were to put a garden hose on one end and a garden hose on the other end, and I turn on, I turn on the water and a lot of water's filling it up, but it's the hose in and the hose out are the same diameter. Well, I mean, there's holes in the basketball, so it's, it's gonna leak, right? But how much more would it leak if I had a fire hose going in and a garden hose coming out, right? It's going to leak a whole lot more. Well, that's the way the afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole are. Afferent arteriole is designed to be more of a fire hose, efferent arteriole garden hose, fluid backs up in the basketball, lots of water comes filtering out through that filtration membrane. Now, this is really cool, so pay attention. These cells, the juxtaglomerular cells, they've got a number of roles. But one of the things that the juxtaglomerular cells do is they measure blood pressure. And when blood pressure is higher, they are smooth muscle cells that will constrict a little bit and make the fire hose a little bit smaller. When blood pressure is low, they will relax and make the fire hose end a little bit bigger. So why is that useful? If your blood pressure is kind of low, then pressure inside of here might be low and you might not get enough urine starting to form. So you can fix the pressure inside of the glomerulus by making the asymmetry between the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterioles greater. So when your blood pressure is low, the juxtaglomerular cells sense that, they'll dilate, they make the fire hose an even bigger fire hose, and that maintains pressure inside of the glomerulus so that you keep getting a lot of filtrate forming. Um, and the opposite also happens. When their blood pressure is too high, that high blood pressure could actually damage the glomerulus and cause it to blow out. The juxtaglomerular cells sense that, they constrict, and that will even out the pressure in here so that the pressure never gets too high in the renal corpuscle. We're gonna start there at the beginning of the next video.